Uh, let's let's go ahead and get started. Um, so uh, we are at the end, at the finish line. Congratulations to all of you who have stuck with it. Uh, it's been an amazing journey. Uh, and we're going to have another meetup that's um, going to be devoted solely to looking at the whole thing, um, taking in the whole thing. But today we're, we're still going to discuss primarily the uh, last cantos of Paradiso uh, and the, the, you know, the, the final destination of our journey, the, the vision of God, the beatific vision. So what I want to do um, is a couple of things. Uh, do you guys remember that um, spreadsheet that I, um, I made for the, the worlds of Dante? Uh, what I want to do is I actually want to post that in, in the chat. Uh, give me just a second to do that. And basically we want to, uh, and the reason I want to do that is just to orient us because there's, uh, there's so much detail in this work that unless you are almost keeping like a spreadsheet of what's happening, it's very easy to lose track of things. And we're moving so fast in, in some ways that again, it's, um, it's uh, somewhat disorienting, at least for me, because there's so much detail and so much uh, going on. All right, so here we go. Uh, so if you look in the chat, it's called Dante Worlds and there's a tab there for um, par uh, Paradiso. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open this up on my computer and share my screen so we can look at it together. And just, just to go over where we've been and what we're talking about today. So let me share my screen and we can follow along together, okay. Can you see? Can everyone see my screen? Uh, Doug, can you see my screen? Uh, hold yes. on, I was looking for something else. Yes. Oh, I oh, oh, yeah. Screen. Okay. Yeah, great. They, great. I was looking for something else. Can All you right. zoom in a little? Uh, yes, I can. Well, you can also go up to the view options and enlarge it any way size you want. Um, yes, let's let's do that. And you, uh, but I mean, each individual can do it to whatever size their eyes can read. Yeah, I, yeah, that's why I wanted you guys to do, uh, download it first, so you can kind of follow along. And if you want to, uh, but but basically, this is the the, the map, right, of Paradiso. Uh, and in each in each world that we've been traversing, there's a similar map because everything is very structured and everything is very organized. And of course, when Dante was writing this, he had a he had a map. So he, you know, he worked from central planning was, was his uh, theme, both in content of the worlds he's describing, but also his own way that he uh, planned this. So this is not spontaneous at all. It's very, very structured, very directed. So we've been, you know, last time we finished with our journey through the seven planets. And we stopped as we were uh, emerging from the sphere of Saturn into the sphere of the fixed stars and looking back, looking back on Earth, realizing how small Earth is. And, and by the way, I don't know if you, you've been surprised by that because I know there's a lot of, sometimes you hear people talk about how people in medieval times placed much more importance on Earth in the grand scheme of things, but not really astronomically, I don't think. I think there was a, common understanding that Earth in, in the scheme of the planet. Um, and also, uh, I was actually uh, re just rereading uh, The Dream of Scipio uh, by Cicero. And of course, uh, a lot of Dante's work mimics uh, this, uh, The Dream of Scipio, which if you haven't read, is basically a, a similar journey, journey to the heavens, journey through the stars. And, and in it, uh, Cicero describes the, the nine spheres, just like we have 10 heavens, he, all, he has nine heavens and Dante adds, kind of divides the, the heavenly sphere into primum mobile and the Empyrean, but it's, it's generally the same scheme. So you have seven planets and then you have another sphere that envelops the seven planets and contains them. So uh, in this particular, section, we were traversing 
the fixed stars, and, and this is where Dante gets um, tested, catechized, uh, uh, and he gets tested by the three great apostles, St. Peter, St. James, St. John, on the matters of faith, hope, and love, the three great Christian virtues, uh, uh, and each one tests him of what, what these respective things are, and Dante, of course, passes the test, and it's, uh, it's almost you get the sense that he is mimicking the medieval university, where in order to get your um, doctor of philosophy uh, title or doctor of theology, you, are, you have to pass the, the, the oral test and you get questioned by the, you know, get uh, challenged by the uh, other doctors before you can, you can earn the title yourself. And that's, that's the process. He's essentially getting tested by, by the three great barons, as they're called, uh, of faith, St. Peter, St. James, St. John. And then, of course, we have the Prima Mobile, which we, we will talk about, um, another sphere, which is a very interesting sphere. Um, and then the Empyrean, which is the sphere that is actually not really, um, you know, we, we're at this point, we're not really connected to physical experiences anymore. It's more of a spiritual experience. It's not a place. It's more of a conceptual thing. And this is where we get the vision of the rose and the vision of God. So uh, this is the um, kind of the setup of our conversation today. I wanted to maybe let Doug speak to his, um, and I'm gonna stop sharing because this is pretty much all I wanted to show here. Um, maybe I'll let Doug uh, jump in and share some of his thoughts on this. And then I, I have some other things I wanted to share that are more specific to particular topics. Uh, but Doug, go ahead if you if you're ready. Well, there are a lot of uh, different things that I got hit on this week, and uh, in reviewing all of it, because uh, as Joe said and Phil said, paradise I really wrestled with. I really hated it up to a certain point, and then I flipped and began to really love it, uh, as I did the first time. And I, I think the first time when I read it. I was closer to reading a lot of Sufic literature. So some of what he's doing became really very quickly apparent to me the first time through. This time through, I really wrestled with it and had to retrieve some of that. Uh, and to hit on some of that very briefly, there's one image I wanna throw out, which I think is relevant to all of Paradiso. And it's something in the Sufi literature. I can't remember who wrote it, whether it was Al Ghazali, but it's a and it's an image that other people pick up, but it's called a niche for lights or niche for lights or the, you know, the niche. And so if you look at a, a kind of an opening in a wall where a, an oil lamp is placed or a candle is placed and the niche or niche is lit up, right? So the image is, it's lit up by the flame, but the flame goes into the oil and the oil comes from you know, maybe an olive or some other plant or the wax, and it comes from something that's a plant-based or bee-based or, you know, like the bees and the wax. And then all of that then comes from uh, flowers and plants and it comes from the sun. So that the light, the layers of what is the real light, what is the true light, I think is all of Paradiso is sort of riddled with that image. And so, and there's another phrase in Sufi literature called light upon light. And that's constantly happening here. And about a few days ago, I began to think of this. And in recent years, you can see this in some cathedrals around our country, but you see it really profoundly in the cathedrals of Europe when you're in Poland or somewhere else. And the number of candles and the number of flames that are lit and how the wind maybe coming through the church makes them flicker and seem alive and how they, or they go very still or even one point I was meditating a lot with a candle and I realized that if my breath was really calm, the candle was still. If my breath was not calm and I was rattled, the candle would flicker in just the wind from my breath, you know, being three or four feet away from it, it would, it would shift, it would change. So I think those ideas of flames and lights that are alive come very much out of the experience of being in a cathedral and there are a couple of things I want to hit on very quickly. And one is a quote from Henry James that actually says, 
my idea of paradise is a perfect automobile going 30 miles per hour on a smooth road to a 12th century cathedral. So that automobile speeding down a road and the destination is a cathedral, that's paradise to Henry James. So I think it's worth saying, what is paradise for you? And there are a lot of heart meditations in many different disciplines that say, if you think of something that really moves you with a feeling of expansion and love, if you meditate on that and you throw the troubles of your day into that sort of energy, into that light, it will make, it will allow you to integrate both the light and dark of the experience in your life. So I, I think the idea of light and tracking it through it from scientific optical, and I even extended this into Oppenheimer when he saw the atomic bomb explode, two lines from the Bhagavad Gita came into his mind and he learned Sanskrit to study the Bhagavad Gita in the original language. And when he saw the ball of explosion, which was a ball and it was a flash that was instantaneous and then the mushroom cloud emerged out of that and it was spherical. There's footage of that. You can see the bubble of the initial atomic blast and then the smoke arising out of it. And the thoughts that came to him was a line out of the Bhagavad Gita, Gita called like the light of a million suns. And then the other quote that came to him was, I am death and I come to devour everything. Those two quotes flashed into his mind when he, there's footage of him actually talking about this in a movie called, uh, John Els did the movie called Day After Trinity, which is a brilliant movie about brilliant minds dealing with the joy of discovery and then the depression of what they discovered. It's an amazing kind of uh, movie about the light and dark of that whole journey of the Manhattan Project. Uh, so that's one thing. So Henry James speeding down a road to a cathedral, that's paradise. <laughs> Oppenheimer had one concept of paradise, but by the end of his life, his life was blasted. And it's said that Einstein, Bucky said that about Einstein, Bucky Fuller, that his life after the atomic bomb was absolutely blasted. He couldn't really take much pride in all the work that he had done. So that idea that hell is something on this earth. And then there are uh, the other thing that struck me, and I, I'm just going to touch on it lightly because I'm not sure where to go with it, is John the Baptist wandering through the wilderness, who's the patron saint of Florence. And then the, the Paradiso, there's a lot of stuff that starts to echo. Mars is important in Florence, and uh, like a statue of Mars and a statue of John the Baptist, and they're like at opposite sides of the city, I think. And so the wars of Florence... Uh, and the uh, John the Baptist wandering through the wilderness and baptism, you know, brings salvation and all of that. There are these things, but also the wilderness, the, the memory of Florence, the legacy of Florence is like a paradise. And by the end, he's talking about the Garden of Eden and the fall of Adam and, and the fall of Florence that kind of starts to inter interweave those. So you're you're falling from a kind of blessed state into something more uh, degraded. And that comes up in the preaching of uh, the rants about the popes and then the rants about the preachers, which I, the second time I read that, I realized, because uh, Ginny comes from theater as well, that that's really the theater of religion that he hates, you know? He actually says, those preachers, if they get a laugh, they're happy, right? Because then they've entertained their audience and they can start to sell them things. It's like a, it's a spiritual medicine show. If I can get you to laugh, and all of TV is based on the medicine show rhythm, you know, a message, a comic act, a musical act, and then a pitch for drugs, which we're still doing that. TV is still totally dependent on the pharmaceutical companies that originally sold the snake oil. So the idea of when religion becomes entertaining and the entertainment and the Sufi traditions can grab the attention of the audience, but then what do you do with it? Do you do something good with it or just try to make money out of it? And I think in theater, the idea is theater is something more than pure entertainment is a battle that goes on among theater people constantly and marketing directors and all of that. 
So the idea of do you take your highest skills and insights and turn them into money or do you turn them into art and truth and something that will move us forward? So that's really what he's doing. There's also the obligation to become yourself. And I ran across a, a, a uh, a, a quote from a rabbi, I have it down here, but I can't find it right now, but it says, I'm not so afraid that God will accuse me of not being Moses. I'm afraid of him accusing me of not being myself, you know, and that he has an obligation to be the rabbi he's meant to be, not to be Moses, not to be all these. And I think that runs through Dante. What's the vision you have for what you should be doing with your life? And I think that's a major through line. So in theater, we talk about the separate beats and units, but then we talk about the through line of what all the beats and units add up to. And I think Dante, as I think Isabel said one time, that you know, unless you go into the details, you can't fully understand it. But also with the entertainment, I did want to mention something my brother turned me on to before he passed away. And it was like Sam Kinison DVD called, the subtitle is, Why Did We Laugh? And he was a preacher who didn't like to preach fire and brimstone. He liked to preach love. But apparently his congregation dwindled when he preached love and he didn't really want to preach fire and brimstone. So he walked away from being a preacher and he became a stand-up comic and he could do fire and brimstone as a stand-up comic and show us how we were living. And so in Dante, there is a certain amount of Sam Kinison doing these rants about popes and power and patriarchy that's out for money, uh, as opposed to any kind of real truth. So this is an amazing documentary. And he's a guy who really sorted out the dark shadows of his life, got married, had a good life, and then he died in a freak car accident. So it's a very strange documentary about a man who kind of finds grace and then disappears. But it's really, it's, and my brother turned me on to it, and it's, uh, it's very bizarre how his rant comedy was rooted in religion and going to church and listening to preachers his whole life. And, but then when you entertain, there is a tradition in the Sufi thing that you, that you, you like patchwork clowns where some people, traditions, they think they were like Sufis who grabbed the attention of an audience with music and clowning but then what did they do with that attention? Where did they aim it? So I think all of the attention, the other thing is the visibility of God. And I'll, I'll, I'll end with this, that the, the multifoliate rose is like a theater, right? And everybody can see everybody. And like in the Greek theater and the amphitheaters and the, the theater is really about the audiences and how they react. It's not about the actors. I mean, we go to watch the actors, but it's ultimately about the breath that comes from the audience, which is what's so sad about now theaters and wearing masks in a theater. But the word theater means to see, and it means to optically to see and not necessarily metaphysically to see, but in the world of Dante, they're fused. You see the people who see the people above them who see God and they look up to God and the angels, and then they look back down to us and they pass the energy from above down to below. And in that multifoliate rose, it's a theater where you're seeing others looking at the point, the, 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 the divine point really leads to a kind of energy that reinvents your life, that transforms you. And he actually says that, it transforms the people there. And it cannot be expressed in words. The further you go to the end of paradise, this cannot be experienced in words. This is an experiential state, which makes me think it really is based on contemplation, which he uses that word a lot, which is like meditation, which is like prayer. And those states of going inward lead to these explosions of energy in all cultures. You know, in the East, they call it Kundalini energy. In our modern culture, we call it psychosis or, you know, schizophrenia. William James wrote about it in one way. Uh, many people, you know, talk about it in different ways. But I keep asking and then I realize, you know, what is the experience of this? How experiential is it? Or is it just poetic conventions? And it's easy to talk about the poetic conventions. But I think it points to an inner state that is 
you know, um, like dropping acid almost, or which I never did. So I can't speak to that myself, but, you know, but I did have experiences just straight that were, where colors were very rich, where my brain was working very quickly to the point where it was really beginning to scare me, where it was like, oh, this is too much, too fast. And, uh, and so how much of this was experiential for Dante and how much of it, uh, and how much of it is based on Sufi conventions? Because the Sufi conventions also say that there are spirits between God and us who help us. I mean, layers of spirits that go down. And so that's what's in the multifoliate rose and the spirits he meets. They're, they look up, they get energy from the divine being, and then they look down and share that energy with us. And that that's in a lot of different traditions. I think even in the Buddhist traditions, but I'm not aware of all the deities in Buddhist traditions as much as I am in some other traditions. So that I'll end with that. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Okay, I, I want to do something before I open the, up the floor to uh, everyone else, which is, um, you know, it's, it's interesting. Uh, Doug and I, we have such a very different, um, I guess, uh, mode of operation, you know, I'm much more structured and Doug is much more poetic and uh, artistic. And I think it, it gives a good balance between different ways to approaching Dante because Dante was both. He was a, a brilliant poet an artist, but he was also an amazing intellectual. And we see both aspects of him in, again, uh, you know, which is uh, why uh, it's easy for me to you know, create a spreadsheet like this and, and share with you because he is so structured. He is so detail oriented. And there's so much detail that goes into all of this in, in expressing these worlds and the symbolism behind them. Um, but what I want to do is uh, maybe just before I open up the floor to everyone else, and you can maybe start thinking about what you want to share, is again paint the, the broad strokes of some of the themes that we touched upon in this reading. And there's so many. This, this has been actually one of the densest uh, passages that we've had before us. There's so many interesting topics, and I don't want to necessarily jump into any particular one, but I want to at least... Uh, mention them so that we could, you know, you guys can decide what you want to talk about, what you want to delve into. Uh, so one of the things that I wanted to talk about, and maybe I will later, is the central place that Mary uh, plays in, in the whole thing. I mean, um, you know, in Canto 33, the last canto, we maybe a third of it is devoted to a prayer by St. Bernard to Mary. Uh, she's the queen of heaven, she is the one who ascends from the um, sphere of fixed stars into the Empyrean before Dante and uh, Beatrice get there. She's definitely at the center stage. And there's so much we, you know, we can talk about there, the historical aspect of how, how, it became, how she became the focal point of devotion in, in Catholic uh, um, uh, sort of scheme of things and also in Dante's own um, beliefs and so forth. Uh, the other um, big topic is this question of angels and the hierarchies of heaven and um, just the different place of, of, of um, experience of the, of, you know, you have these different subs, almost like different levels of creation. You have God uncreated, then you have angels who are pure, pure in some way, pure expressions of, of, potentiality maybe, or something like that. And then you have human beings and the world, which is kind of an amalgam of, 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 of these different things, the form and the essence. Uh, and Dante definitely gets into, um, into that in, in different ways, both uh, as he asks questions of Beatrice and also as she describes the creation of the world, different things there, fascinating stuff. Uh, of course, we have the, the questions of, um, of theology, you know, what is faith, what is hope, what is love, uh, how are they defined, and there are interesting things to talk about there. Uh, then we have this really momentous meeting with Adam, right, the first man, and uh, Dante, having been tested, he now tests, not tests, but he questions Adam, he wants to know, 
all kinds of interesting things about the language that Adam spoke and how long he was in paradise and how long he was in paradise before he was tempted. All of these questions that, that are interesting to talk about and think about and why they are important to him. Uh, then we have the what I would call the spiritual physics in primum mobile, the sphere that is fastest of all the spheres and which is the um, one that's moving the rest of, of the world, right? The, it's causing the motion of the spheres in Dante's cosmology. So the, the sphere of um, primum mobile and how it's different from, it, its operation is not governed by physical laws, it's governed by spiritual laws because we're in heaven and in heaven, we have a different type of physics. I would call it spiritual physics. And um, I even have a little diagram to show maybe later uh, of how, I, how it seems to be envisioned. Um, so we can talk about that. And then of course you have the idea of the Empyrean and its nature and it's um, maybe connection to Gnosticism because it's so abstract. You know, there's very little physical descriptions there, even less than in Revelation. It's just light, love, happiness, very abstract notions, not, not much to go by. And even the rose itself seems to be uh, this abstract symbolical construct. Uh, finally, uh, and this is probably the most important thing to talk about is the beatific vision. What is the ultimate vision that Dante sees. What is it about God that is the ultimate mystery? And it, if you've read it, I don't know if you were surprised uh, to read that the ultimate thing that is surprising, the mystery of mysteries, is that God seems to be in the image of man. There is the likeness of man in the Godhead. Uh, and then God is, you know, he is portrayed as the circles within circles, the three circles that are mutually rotating and mutually reflecting and they have different colors and but the, yet they're one this mystery of trinity and th this this you know this really interesting vision of of of, of god the, the symbolic uh, representation of god so these are to me some of the major themes uh and then i, I like i said i'm, I'm going to open it up to you uh and if i've missed something please um share something that maybe was interesting to you that i did not list uh, so with that, I'm going to open it up. Um, what you want to do is just uh, type in exclamation in the chat, and then we will proceed with uh, hearing from you. I wanted to just underline one thing that a lot of the my trying to grasp the sweep of this has been dependent on seeing Phil's graphs, <laughs> you know, where I could <laughs> like go, oh, those are the beats and units, and there's a through line there that was imperceptible to me going chapter by chapter. So thank you. For yes, that. I've tried. I've tried my best. <laughs> All right, Ginny. And well, um, I just wanted to tell Doug. Uh, you know, you've made me feel badly. Um, I, I didn't know that when I did live theater, I was supporting, I was working basically for um, advertisers. Um, um, you're, I hope you're just talking about not live theater or even films, but television. Um, made me feel terrible that because when I'm performing, I I think I'm just performing for the audience. You know, I don't think my think of myself as supporting a company, advertisers. Just wanted to uh, make that comment. Yeah, I am talking about TV. Yeah, the, the intervals <laughs> yeah. of entertainment, moral uplift, and yeah. then a pitch, yeah. and that goes right. back to right. the medicine shows. Yeah, yeah, and. Uh, and there are some great variety shows. There are some great medicine shows. <laughs> but yeah, no, I'm not talking movies. I'm not talking about theater. Incidentally, yeah. incidentally uh, since you brought this up, you know, Dante mentions art as a worthy vocation, uh, in fact, a lawful way for man to earn a living. So there's right. nothing wrong with earning a living through art. He makes it explicit. And he says that, you know, we are the uh, grandsons of God's art. Right. Well, or the, the things that we do are the grandchildren of of the art that, that that God has created. So, in some ways, this is the ultimate expression of of our kind of likeness to 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 the divine connection to the divine. 
So anyway, I just thought I'd throw that out since we're talking about advertisers. <laughs> uh, okay, Joe, sorry, go ahead, Joe. Oh, no problem. I mean, I mean, uh, I'll be brief. The area that I'm going to choose to focus on are uh, the fixed stars with uh, faith, faith, hope, and charity. I mean, uh, our love. Um, you know that that uh, that's something that's always kind of been of interest to me, and I can honestly say that this has kind of changed a little bit of my perspective on uh, the theological virtues. Um, in the sense that faith is, uh, it's more based on reason than I thought versus the idea that it's this, just it's something that you have to have and it's irrational. Um, it's much more rational in the sense that it kind of calls into question, it kind of under, like allows you to understand the limits of human reasoning. And so by having that, having faith, um, it was, you know, it, it, this, this passage actually in particular that it, it really did speak to me where it started to, um, uh, uh, it started to establish essentially um, my understanding of faith was not necessarily, it was much more theological and just irrational up until this point. Um, there are a couple of passages I'm looking for. It. I'll get to them in a minute. Um, the also the idea of hope in general and its relationship to time, um, how to view that. Uh, and one of the things that was interesting uh, was uh, how hope kind of transcends your past in the sense that in, in a, if you're hoping for the future, it's something that you are looking to the, to change the way you view the world. It's not only the way you view the future, but it's way like something bad happened, but you're hoping for something new and that you, if you end up, you know, um, that expectation ends up being met, it transforms the way that you looked at. So the idea of being thrown out of Florence and kicked out of Florence and the idea of having, you know, the of even returning to Florence, you would look at that completely differently. Now, this is like it's very different than the way the Greeks looked at hope. Um, the Greeks looked at hope as something that's irrational and that ultimately uh, that it gave you you had a set of expectations about the future that um, that if they're not met then it's automatically going to be a letdown so that you should not have that essentially as a way of you'll never be disappointed if you don't have hope. So it's kind of in contrast to something that the way I viewed hope uh, as well. Um, the other part is the idea of knowing God uh, as well as far as loving him. Um, to, truly, to truly know God is to truly love him. And uh, this is something that you could see where it's love prevented Dante from actually killing himself um, in a way you could say for his love for the lady Beatrice or whatever, you know, uh, that, but um, you also get the idea that in order to love, you actually have to understand darkness. So this kind of goes back to the whole journey in and of itself, that you're going through hell for a reason, because you cannot truly love until you actually truly understand what it is to, 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 you have to go down in order to go up. And that's kind of like where he, that, that kind of captures his journey. Um, and uh, I'm trying to, I'm trying to think of something else that I wanted to say too. Um, something about a site being restored, but I forget what I was going to say at the moment. Um, those will be my comments for now, actually. Uh, but okay. I, I have a I, few I have a question for you. Uh, since you brought up the, you know, this this canto with uh, of cantos uh, where Dante gets tested, what what did you think of the definition of faith? And maybe this is a question for for everyone. Uh, if you, I've uh, it always puzzled me. You know, the, he quotes that passage from 
the Hebrews, um, I think Hebrews 11, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. This is the, que- the answer he gives to so right. Peter when you know, Peter asks him, what is faith? And I, does that make sense to, to you? Um, and if so, how, how? How does it make sense? Uh, and this is a question for everybody. If, you know, maybe you want to address that. Um, um, that faith. That faith is the substance. I guess is the what I'm emphasizing um, of things not seen. Uh, okay. I it makes sense to me um, in in one in one regard in the sense that uh, if you're putting if you the, the way I was looking at it in the sense of that if you define reason in a, in, a, in one way like the idea that you're able to rationally come to a conclusion. Mm-hmm. But then you have this idea of faith. These are things that are not clearly defined in reality. So that this is something that's unseen. I mean, in my opinion. Um, and this is kind of where that is uh, something that, for me, uh, that makes sense. And that's kind of what had me thinking a little bit, is that um if it's if it's not something that is is essentially you can come to rationally then yes faith is something that is uns, is not seen but it doesn't mean that it's not real and that it doesn't play a, it plays a role still in okay. how you live your life so it's still real and it's true so to speak so you could say that virtue is true and that's a theme throughout the entire um, mm-hmm. poem mm-hmm. so okay uh, David, uh, go ahead. I, I thought that was a very interesting message um, <clears throat> that faith is more than one thing. It's made up of these components. I mean, you get to act and do things. And um, presumably if you're acting with your eyes fixed on you know, the right light, <clears throat> you're hoping for the right thing to be happening and you're, you're acting in order to make that happen. So it's your ideas coming into the world. You have something hoped you hope for and you hope for that to become substantial in the world, the good to come into the world. So that's the substance of what you're hoping for. But on the other hand, you don't control the world and you didn't make the rules of the world and you don't, aren't the forces shaping the world. And no matter what you do, things are gonna happen. So for you to also thrive in the chaotic world, you have to have a belief in unseen greater power that makes it all possible to turn into something good. So it's, you know, you see what you are, but you have to also believe that the creation of the world has its benevolence to it also. And being willing to put those together lets you keep living and acting. Otherwise, you despair. So faith gives you the hope for substantial (laughs) good in the world based on what you can't possibly prove, that there's a chance it'll work out, which is a higher power. I like that a lot. Okay. Allison, you're next. Thank you, David. Um, one thing that I was thinking about with it, the three themes that we kept coming up with over and over and over again throughout the whole poem, um, and they were about the idea of will, the idea of um, circles and love. And what I, I really enjoyed is that the very last, the whole poem ends with where he says, um, at this point, power failed, high fantasy, but like a wheel in perfect balance turning, I felt my will and my desire impelled by the love that moves the sun and the other stars. And so he, he ties together all these three themes that over and over, like, why are they keep going in circles? And there's the circles and there's the circle. But you hear he shows it's like the will and the desire intertwined in a circle going around. And then and then the way he writes it said, by the love that moves the sun and the other stars. So it's, you know, you're not quite sure. Does he mean a love of Beatrice or does he mean a love of God or does he mean both? Really? Well, he is talking about love with a capital L. So it is, yeah. it is God who is, it is God. Is that what it, when it's, because, you know, it's not Beatrice who's moving the world. It, it, it is God. Yeah. 
Uh, but but I, I'm actually uh, glad you brought, brought up this passage because it is, you know, al always in any kind of work liter or literature, the most important things are how you start and how you finish. And so mm -hmm. it probably is good for us to look at this verse that you just read because it is so, uh, I feel like it is so good, such a good summation of, like you said, all the different things that we've been talking about over the last um, months and well, almost a year. Uh, now. Um, so let's read it together. I have, um, I'll read it from my translation again, so we can where, find where, it. Where are you starting? Uh, this is uh, Canto 33, uh, the last uh, tercet. So it's uh, verse 142. Uh, I think I actually have the same translation. So um, mine says, here force failed my high fantasy, but my desire and will were moved already like a wheel revolving uniformly by the love that moves the sun and the other stars. So what struck me here uh, is the fact that his will and his desire, most importantly, probably maybe even more importantly than the will, are moved in accord with the motion of this love that moves the worlds. And that's the high point, right? That's what he was aiming at the whole time. We started out when Dante was lost in the woods, uh, didn't know where he was going, and it took us Inferno, Purgatorio, and now we're finally at a point where he is moving in the same orbit with God. That's his sort of final, there's no higher end state, if you will. Then, then the fact that his will and his desire is now in complete accord with this love that moves the world. So he's in this motion parallel, not against whatever God is doing. He's at one, finally, with, with the Godhead. And this happens on the heels of the beatific vision. And I think, Joe, you mentioned the fact that, you know, uh, uh, this knowledge of God is what really causes love of God, which is theologically correct. And Dante makes that point many times that goodness and, and blessedness are really tied to this idea of looking and seeing this divine goodness. Having a vision of divine goodness then is the, um, the reason for all the other things, basically. And, and, and this is the summation of the entire poem, how we reach this end state. Uh, uh, Elena, did you want to uh, comment? Yes, and mm -hmm. I'm just going to go a bit back to Doug's um, light upon light, because it's a part of that too. And I just, um, I came across one of the interpretations that uh, that's relevant to God and, and the light. And um, we could apply it to to the poem and we'll see what, what happens. So I'll just quickly um, read it, these two sentences. Uh, which verse is that? So this, this is not from the, uh, it's not from Dante's. It's, um, it's just okay. uh, making a comment light upon light and how we could implement it in um, interpreting um, what we've been reading. Okay. Um, so it's just the two sentences that I'm going to read and see what, what Doug thinks and everyone else about light and God and uh, what it is altogether. Embedded within certain directions comes this glorious parable of light, which contains layer upon layer of transcendental truth about spiritual mysteries. No notes can do adequate justice to its full meaning and volumes have been written on this subject. So that's, that's the end of it. And um, again, it's, it's a mystery of light that's been brought up and to me light is God. And um, so uh, generally we, we are also um, going through this journey to find out that the truth and the way to, 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 to be in that light perceive that light without any conditions. So just uh, see, uh, recognizing conditions and moving past them, through them, 
and because of them. Mm -hmm. you. you know, it's I, I find it interesting because I, I think I mentioned uh, Gnosticism, uh, you know, in the beginning, and you know the, these descriptions of God as light and love and all these abstract concepts. In some ways, they are very much reminiscent to me, at least, of, of Gnostic literature, you know, apocryphal literature, Christian literature, um, especially, you know, St. John, you know, God is love, God is light, you know, it's all, in some ways, they're sweet, these are sweeping statements that are very deep, but at the same time, they also are so abstract, they, they lack a lot of, you know, something to touch, to put your, put your hands on. So it's interesting that Dante, who is both a person who is obviously um, very much into this abstract language and symbolic thinking, but he's also a poet. And as a poet, he tries, he, he can't help himself. He has to put something concrete about all this stuff. So even when he talks about God as light, he then mentions stars and sun, something concrete that we can touch, something we can relate to. Or when he talks about, um, uh, uh, you know, the colors, you know, he, it's, it's like a rainbow, right? So there's all, always some kind of simile, always some kind of a way for, for, for him to express himself so that we can relate to these concepts that are really transcendental and really beyond. And he mentions it many times that, you know, I'm talking about things that are beyond human comprehension. Um, so yeah, it's fascinating, fascinating um, topic. So, David, yeah. did you wanna say something else? Yeah, one more thing. Uh, and it's it's about this last terza or the last five lines even <clears throat> that um, and I, I think our translations differ. It doesn't say will in mine in there. So that's sort of interesting. He talks about his being here. My powers rest from their high fantasy, but I already could feel my being turned. Mm. Hmm. So, uh, we need to have an Italian expert here uh, and I'm trying to see if. Uh, but uh, it's. It's it's okay because I mean his being is not <laughs> his passive observing being, but his his will as his ability to act, that's his entire being. So it makes sense to me. You you could take either way. way. Okay. But what I like what I like here is he's talking about uniting instinct and intellect, the passions and the thinking. The what we saw um, in the intellect with Virgil taking him all the way halfway through and then Beatrice the passion and love carrying the West the way through and these being united it's fantastic and I think I don't know what it is in the Italian but the the key word in English is turns here as to me is like the key word as on the wheel the wheel of love as and he's depicted in three volumes all of these gizmos, the, the Rube Goldberg, the entire mechanism, the mechanics, all of that is the wheel he's talking about. He's visualized how the whole universe can be seen as working for this purpose. And so whatever he does, he can always grasp onto some image which is drawing him towards the ultimate. I think that's just beautiful to say he's put everything together, whether it's the passion or the reason, that it's all seen in this inexorably turning by the prime mover wheel of love. So he's accomplished that. So he's coming back as in Nirvana. You know, he's completely united with the process that he's part of. His being, whether it's active or passive, is part of this. I think that's an incredible accomplishment. He sort of convinced me. <laughs> well, that's the story. I believe it. It's great. Interesting. Thank you, Dave. Anyone else wants to jump in and share what you, what you Well, I, I wanna say, I think the layers there that, that Elena and that quote point to, but also Dante does really anchor this in metaphors and similes, but he always sort of says, I'm failing to define it because the experience is so extreme that I have captured 1,000th of what I experienced. I mean, he keeps saying this, the failure of words. He keeps talking about that to define. 
And I think it goes back to Moses's desire to see God. And God says, okay, if you go into a crack in the mountain, I will walk by and you'll basically see my backside. You'll see my ass, but you can't look in my face or it will destroy you. And so Dante's quest is to see God and to see the face of God and to condition himself that he won't be destroyed when he does that. That is clearly the through line of the whole poem. Dramatically, if you analyze it as a play, that's his super objective, as Stanislavski would have said. All right, so it's a recap of the Exodus thing. That's really, that's a good way to see it. Oh, so that's Moses, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, Moses holds, Moses stands in the cleft of a rock and God passes by and he sees from behind the, this, the glory, right? It's the same right. thing you're saying. Okay, I, um, if no one else wants to um, jump in right now, what I want to do is take a little uh, little excursion, maybe a one rabbit trail. Typically, we like to stay away from these <laughs> rabbit trails, but I, this one I just couldn't resist. Uh, and, and this particular one is about Mary. Um, now, it's such an interesting topic. I, before I, start, I started looking into this in more depth, I didn't realize it. As we were going through Purgatorio, and I don't know if any of you caught this, did you realize that Mary is mentioned in every single terrace of the Purgatorio as a paragon of a particular virtue that is supposed to be instilled into Dante? I didn't catch that. I, I mean, I, I knew she was in this one and in that one, but I didn't know she was in every single one. Uh, and this, of course, is just a foretaste <clears throat> of her importance that we see in Paradise. So in Paradise, just like I mentioned, just before we get to the final canto, she is crowned. She's in the center of this rose. She is being, um, she's crowned the, the queen of heaven, uh, Regina uh, Celesti, or Regina Coili. Uh, um, she is the, you know, the focal point, which is kind of surprising. If you're coming from um, purely Bible, biblical, Christian background, if you didn't know anything about Catholicism, you would say, well, why isn't Christ the focal point or God? But it's Mary. And, it, and then, of course, the third, the first third of Canto 33 is a prayer to Mary for, um, for Dante to be able to see Godhead. So, of course, she is doing what? She's being this uh, mediatrix between God and Dante. She is lifting him up essentially just like, like what Beatrice was doing to propel him from one sphere to the next. Now Beatrice is not enough. We need to get to Mary to do the same thing for Dante to, to enable him to see Godhead, to have this ultimate vision that we've been striving towards. So the question I had and I started kind of doing a little of research before this meetup, um, how did it happen that Mary, what were the steps historically speaking that we went through for Mary to become such a huge focal point. Because I remember from my knowledge of the New Testament that Mary is really, she doesn't really play a very central role in the New Testament per se. Um, the earliest gospel that we have is the gospel of Mark, which starts out with Jesus starting out his ministry. There is no birth of Jesus. There's no virgin birth. Mary is not even mentioned until, until, one point at which Jesus is preaching and then someone says, hey, your mother and your brothers are standing outside. And, it, and then he turns to the crowd and says, who is my mother and who is my brothers? It's people that do the will of God. So if anything, it's meant to put, put aside any kind of notion of her specialness or her status as anybody special at all. This is Mark, this is the earliest gospel. Now, in Matthew, we get the Christmas story. We get the story of the virgin birth. Uh, and after that, it's, that's it. Uh, in fact, we have the same story in Matthew that I just referred to in Mark. Then there's another story where um, people come to Jesus and they say, uh, when, when he's back in Nazareth in his hometown, and they say, wait a second, this guy, he's the carpenter. He's the guy, we know his mother. <laughs> we know his brothers and sisters. How is he any special? And of course, the fact that he has brothers and sisters is kind of a hint that Mary obviously was not a virgin at that point, at least in the normal sort of human way of interpreting it. 
Uh, then we get to Luke. Now in Luke, Luke is the most flattering of all the gospel writers. And we get the story of Annunciation, the story of Angel Gabriel coming to Mary, announcing to her that she will be the, this vessel of God. And uh, you know, this is where the, the real story of Mary's ascendance into providence, I think, can be traced to is, is the Gospel of Luke. Um, in John, not so much. Nothing really going on in John except Mary and John, St. John. They are at, at the, standing at the cross of Jesus, and Jesus points out to, uh, points to Mary and says, St. John, this is the John, this is your mother, and etc. And so they kind of, he's taking care of her. But that's about it. There's really not, she doesn't play a central role. And then, of course, in the epistles and in Revelation, Mary is not figuring at all. And so it's really after the New Testament that Mary, her, her um, importance begins to rise. And we have the first recorded prayer to Mary very early on. This is in uh, like uh, second century. We have a prayer called Beneath Your um, Beneath Thy Protection, Subtum Praesidium, uh, a Latin prayer. This is around 250 AD. Um, then we have this concept that Mary and Eve are really two sides of the same coin. Whatever Eve undid or, or did, <laughs> Mary undid. And we have the same concept, of course, in here in Paradiso. Right, so we, we meet Eve. She is actually an attendant to Mary, and this concept is is mentioned. Dante picks up on this on this concept, which is uh, an early one. Um, it's mentioned in uh, one of the church fathers, Justin Martyr, around 155 A.D. Then you have this further development. Um, you have the Church Council in fifth century. At Ephesus, and Ephesus is a place where Artemis had been worshipped. Uh, Artemis, of course, was also a virgin goddess. And after Christianity took hold in, at Ephesus, it became a, quite an important center. And so, one of the church councils uh, was held there. This is about a hundred years after Christianity became a legal religion in in the Roman Empire. And there, they decided that Mary deserves the title. God bearer, Theotokos in Greek. It was that or Christ bearer. You know, Christ bearer sounds good, but God bearer sounds even better. <laughs> so she got that going for her. And after that, uh, we have all kinds of an explosion, really, of images of Mary. So artistic, I'm talking about artistic images proliferate. And this uh, really goes very, uh, becomes a very strong current going into medieval times where we have all kinds of depictions of Mary. And I want to show one particular one that I think is pertinent because we're talking about St. Bernard uh, and Mary. So let me uh, show you one that I wanted to see if I can find this real quick. Should have opened this a little bit earlier. Okay, here we go. Sorry. Yes. All right. Can you see? Hmm. This is a depiction of Mary and St. Bernard. And Mary is shooting milk out of her breast into St. Bernard's eyes. And apparently she has these magic qualities that have allowed St. Bernard to perceive her importance. And St. Bernard, of course, was the uh, person that, from whom we have um, a very famous hymn uh, to Mary called Ave Maris Stella, uh, which is uh, Hail uh, the Star of the Sea, uh, who is Mary. That's, that's another title of Mary, the Star of the Sea. And uh, it goes like this, Hail Star of the Sea, nurturing mother of God, and ever virgin, happy gate of heaven, Receiving that Ave from the mouth of Gabriel, establish us in peace, transforming the name of Eva, Eve. So Ave, of course, is the anagram of Eve, 
ever in Latin. And uh, so this is particularly uh, useful when you're trying to say that Mary undid the knot that Eve tied, you know, with our with the fall of humankind. So, uh, so here's a little, just a little excursion, little rabbit hole that I thought uh, maybe we, we can go on just to explore the historical progression of how Mary became uh, this focal point. And of course, Dante seems to have bought completely into that. And he mentions, in fact, that he rises uh, and goes to bed with Mary's name on his lips. So in fact, he prays to Mary. Um, and, but in general, it's such an interesting concept uh, of, of the role of femininity in religion and the reason why there was apparently a need for a female presence in, 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 in Christianity that, you know, all these religions that Christianity superseded, they always had some sort of female goddess, you know, Kibela, Artemis. Uh, we, we see it everywhere. But in Christianity, Godhead was seen as more of a male-only character. And apparently that did not, you know, work for people. And so Mary became immensely popular. There were all kinds of apocryphal stories about Mary's lineage, her grandparents, her excursions and her adventures after Christ's, you know, ascension. And of course, she was supposed to be assumed to heaven herself. And then there was theological progression about, okay, she was actually always a virgin and never even, you know, just, I don't know how that works, but she's a virgin um, and the mother at the same time. And in fact, Dante, when he addresses, uh, not Dante, when St. Bernard addresses her in prayer, the way he addresses her is uh, uh, Virgina Madre, so mother virgin. And I, I mean, I'm not a Catholic, but I imagine that's probably a very common uh, way to address Mary uh, as, as virgin mother, which of course the two things are contradictory when you think about them. <laughs> um, anyway, I thought I'd bring this up and see if anyone wanted to take up this rabbit hole and maybe comment on it, or you know, if you have any thoughts. Uh, David, go ahead. Yeah, um, I, well, I'm gonna comment on um, the saint who is there accompanying her, okay? So uh, it, Bernard, it turns out that he would be a particularly safe male to have there in that situation that was depicted. He's extremely like non-characteristically connected to women. Um, he was brought in to run his local abbey, abbey or whatever it was, and he, they were having I guess, employment problems at the time, but he drummed up this community of his whole family and all the men, and they brought them all in and they all divorced their wives and they became devoted to this thing. He's like this accomplisher. And the, when it's told, when Dante's talking about him, I think he has these figures of bees that are going back and forth to create something in the, the final cantos as Bernard's talking. That's his symbol because he's like this super busy, creative energy of you know, that, that he's brought into the church. So he's like their highest hero in this way. And so to have him depicted here removes any sense of sexuality at all from that scene. And he's there with his complete pious, empty well, stare. Dr. Dr. Freud, <clears throat> Dr. Freud would probably disagree, but uh, I <laughs> point to Right, I'm just saying how this would be, you know, he's, he's the one who just like tears you out of your family and turns you to the church, right? right? right. So. He, was, he was an amazing theologian, uh, St. Bernard. He traveled all over Europe. Uh, he composed a lo lots and lots of sermons, which we have still available awesome. to us, hymns. Yeah. Um, he, he was a busy guy. Yeah, he was an amazing, amazing person. Uh, Al Allison, did you want to comment? Um, yeah, I think, um, I mean, I don't know a whole lot about religious his history, really, in general, and when Mary is popular or not. But I feel like this is really kind of this whole theme throughout, you know, whether it's Eve, Mary, or Beatrice. But really, it all comes down to one basic idea is that women create life. I mean, obviously men and women do their part, but but let's be real, the baby grows inside a woman. I mean, there's no, like I, to me, it's funny when I hear men say, oh, we're pregnant. 
no, you're not. No, no, no man is pregnant. No, the woman does it. The woman does, it, you know. And so I think, um, you know, give it's credit <coughs> where credit is due, right? I'm sorry. I give credit where credit is due, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, I'm like, why are women tired when they're pregnant? Because they're making a human being, that, you know, like they're building a brain, they're building a heart, and it's exhausting. Yeah. Uh, Allison, there was just something in the news about yeah. some birds where I guess there weren't males around spontaneously became pregnant. So the idea of this, you know, conception, immaculate conception, it's like, Nature does these things. They don't need the guys. So, no, you need the guys. <laughs> no, no, I mean, this, is, this, actually, this actually was on the news this week, that this actually happened in certain, you know, the way frogs can turn from male to female or vice versa, whatever it is when they're needed. It's, it's bizarre. But, yeah, the, man, the, the male isn't the one having the kids. You're right. Absolutely not right. the right image at all. <laughs> uh, Joe, did you want to comment? Uh, yeah, normally I can say that I want to build on what David said, but that's, this is probably one of those times that I can't say that. Um, uh, so in any case, uh, the, um, uh, the, the role of Mary, I mean, is, it, it was funny because when I was reading La Vida Nova, uh, that I really thought that Patrice was Mary. That's the way I got the feeling for that almost that the way she was held in such reverence and even the way he holds her in such reverence now that he has this, this, uh, that, uh, this kind of, a, a um, appreciation for, uh, for the blessed mother or, or women in general. But I think that the role of Mary is also very important in another way as well, is that she also is an intercessor uh where for catholics specifically and a lot of people say that god can't say no to his mother so that if you go to his intercessor so one example would be and we just covered this in another um uh another uh, uh meetup with sri khan is the wedding at cana mm -hmm. um and when he said you know my time has not yet come and she's like yes it has essentially and and essentially that his mother is is really the person that that shapes god um there's also the fact that there's the role of the mother of in every in every uh um person's life i mean so it's and it's unique um and it is something that needs to be celebrated so that a lot of people then um it, you know the catholic church obviously knows this uh so I, I think that's why you also see the the growing importance of the Blessed Mother. I mean, because it's also the grow like with wisdom, but I think that there's also other aspects to it anyway. But anyway, I always got the feeling that Patrice was the Blessed, was a, was a, like almost he was explaining the Blessed Mother throughout the, the even, even throughout this, this poem as well. So anyway, that well, was just my there's thought. A, there's an interesting chain of, 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 of intercession going on. If you remember how we started, Mary was the one that dispatched St. Lucia, who right. dispatched Beatrice, who dispatched right. Virgil <laughs> to get Dante. So we have these three women who essentially are doing this in interceding on, on his behalf, starting at the very top, Mary, St. Lucia, Beatrice, um, which in itself, gives them this mediate, mediating power, mediating office. However, what, what puzzles me personally is the contrast between how strongly Dante opposes nepotism in the church, and yet we have this nepotism happening <laughs> at the highest levels of heaven, where because Mary happens to be the mother of Jesus, she has this extra pull with him, essentially. Uh, no, that's not how I'm. Uh, go ahead, uh, Doug. You, you well, I, I hate to jump in front, but you know the way the story is told is it's she's done because of who she is and done all this, and she is chosen to be mm -hmm. the only possible human receptacle for this miracle. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. so it's like the other way around. The only way God can come into the world is because this woman 
is going to stand with all of these, you know, and, and Dante's, he's built this whole thing and everything with structures. Something's holy because we're separated from it. I mean, mm-hmm. it's got protections and it's sanctity and inside, inside, inside. And so we're going to have so many layers. Every time we approach it, we're looking at Beatrice because we can't look at the light. And then we're looking, you know, Beatrice so we can look at the light of Mary so we can finally see. So these, these are our little steps. It is, it is a whole of mirrors. Constant Absolutely. striving. Yeah, the Madrushka. It's because that's what the structure <laughs> of holiness is for humanity. It's like not the everyday, but to bring it into the everyday, to be allowed to connect to it, draw proximate and closer and in. We need something on that side that's going to pull us in, that love. You know, so right. if, if God has a tough side, then we need this other side. Right. Uh, Maxine, did you want to did you want to uh, say something? They are doing experimentation now, uh, so that men can carry babies and give birth. Um, yes, in the future that will be a definite because they're halfway there already. Halfway. All right, thank you, <laughs> Doug. Did, did you want to add to that? No, well, that sent my mind into another rabbit hole, but. Uh, uh, <laughs> He, Dante does refer to her as the virgin mother and the daughter of Christ or the daughter. I mean, so it's this mother-daughter thing, which is interesting. And uh, I would say, you know, that you know, that was a great kind of review of the history of Mary, uh, because I think a lot of the Mary cults started in the medieval period and uh, and they show up all over the world. I mean, every time a religion tries to become too patriarchal, the divine mother kind of shows up, pops up in folk culture. And uh, uh, and it's fascinating. I, and it was actually in the early Mormon church. There, were, there was a lot of talk at that time, less so now, except among some women, of the father in heaven and the mother in heaven. And that was a very real thing. And there were hymns sung in church about the mother in heaven. And there were female prophets in the 19th century. And my great, great grandmother was one of them actually. And there were two or three of them. One wrote a lot of the Mormon hymns. So women played a really big role in early Mormon culture. In a lot of ways, the men went around the world converting people and as essence a pilgrimage to convert the world. And the women ran the ranches and farms in Utah the way the Roman matrons ran the Roman villas when their men were away at the Senate or fighting wars or getting into whatever trouble they were getting into. So the feminine presence in religion keeps reemerging um, spontaneously, even to the, when it's trying, when people try to exclude it. So. I think it's a good rabbit hole, Phil. Thank you for that. <laughs> All right. Um, I have another one I could point out. I can state very quickly a rabbit hole that I was struck by. And it's a, it's a phrase where he says, uh, the reason for the fall was the accursed presumption of the one you saw below crushed by the weight of all the universe. And so I realized that a cursed presumption is pride and Dante identifies with pride. So I was wondering how much Dante identifies with Satan because he talks a lot about his own pride as his biggest sin. So that just occurred to me like a day or so ago in the last 24, 48 hours. So I'm, I'm just curious if anyone, if anyone's ever written about that, you know, the pride of Satan, which Milton certainly explores but the pride of Dante, which even Boccaccio talks about in his old age, Dante was very nasty to kids in the street and other people. I mean, he was like uh, fairly aggressive, you know, apparently with people. Uh, That was from the Inferno, you read that? No, that's from the Paradiso, the thing I just read where they talk about- uh, Adam uh, and the fall and all that stuff. Well, the Paradiso keeps reverting back to old themes, like going back down below, going to the bottom of the universe, center of the universe, to (laughs) climb to the heights of the universe, as Joe mentioned, going down to go up. But also this was, I'll try to find it again. It's uh, it's something I circled and yeah, I should have quoted the verse and chapter. But I'll find it. I'll put it in the chat. Let's move on to what Phil was going to move on to. 
Right. So we, we're going to go to uh, breakout rooms now, uh, just so that we can maybe divide up, divide and conquer. So anything you want to talk about in the breakout rooms, feel free to raise, and then we then we're going to come back and maybe compare notes. Um, so I have assigned everybody to, to the breakout rooms, and uh, we'll do it for, uh, I guess, uh, 30 minutes, and then we'll come back and then compare notes and see where we want to go from there, maybe do a Q&A session. Okay, welcome back, everyone. Hope you had a good time in your breakout rooms. Um, at this point, uh, we want to open it up for any kind of questions or any concluding thoughts or anything that maybe you have uh, discussed in your group that you want to share with, with the rest of us. So just type in uh, exclamation point and we'll, we'll, we'll try to take your questions and Anyone? No, no questions. Great. If no questions, I have a ton of stuff that I could, I uh, wanted to. Well, no, there's the one really important thing that came in our group. I think was Allison pointed out that we keep remembering how much of our everyday images of all over have really originated in this compilation of images. You know, when we think of hell in different ways, well, this is like the seminal real. Can't, I can't imagine before Dante. That's all I'm saying, you know. Uh, Joe, go ahead. So we had a interest, you know, very interesting discussion, and we started actually reading certain passages. Um, and I realized, wow, I really missed a lot. <laughs> uh, so, how, and I can definitely see where why somebody would read this uh, multiple times, like a lot of times, in order to really fully appreciate everything. Um, maybe one of the questions that I guess I, I could ask and frame it is just, I, I guess, why the theological virtues and not the cardinal virtues necessarily were included? I, I mean, I don't know if that's a fair question. It, you know, is that, I mean, I, I just don't, I, I have my own theories, but I, I would, if anybody has a theory on that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I would like, I would like uh, to hear that. Uh, yeah, and, and if you want to, if you want to pick, uh, well, let's do this. Let's list all the questions first, like we typically do, and then we will go one by one. So, so I'll, let me write this one down. So, why Christian and not cardinal virtues, right? Uh, anyone else who wants to ask anything or share something? Don't all speak at once. <laughs> Does anybody have a question about? I wanted to share that we our group did much the same thing that I think Joseph was talking about, where we started just reading favorite lines to each other in sections, and it was really interesting the different hits that different people had, mm -hmm. which would remind me of something that I loved or was intrigued by, but had forgotten completely. So, okay. Uh, Madeline, go ahead. No, Madeline, you. Have okay, a... there we go. I was on oh. mute. <laughs> okay, um, I think it was Canto <clears throat> twenty six. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things we talked about was line. Um, here we go. So Canto twenty six, line ninety seven. So here he's in the fixed stars and he is meeting Adam. And his very first introduction to Adam is, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the very few <clears throat> references to um, the body as an animal. He says, sometimes a hidden animal stirs in such a way that its affect appears as its covering follows it. Similarly, the first made soul made me see through its wrapping how gaily it came to please me. And it was, um, since I did not do the most uh, complete reading of it all, I was just wondering um, if anyone else had thoughts about 
whether or not animal imagery uh, appears with Adam in the Paradiso, because most of the, I think the only animal really in here is uh, the eagle of Christ. Right. So the question is, what is the animal imagery in, in, that, in that passage? Yeah, or, or what do people think about um, the, the comparing of Adam with an animal? Yeah, that's basically it. Okay. All right. So comparing Adam to an animal. All right. That's an interesting one. Uh, I haven't thought of that one too much. Uh, kind of read past it and not, you know, there, you, yeah, I think all of us, we, we, we read and we stop at points that are interesting to us. So that's good to discuss different, different things like that. Uh, anyone else has anything they want to ask? Yeah. Um, I just wanted to comment that we talked about that exact line in, in our group too. So, oh, really? You did? Yeah. Well, that exactly. Exact, exactly. Like, well, that exact line. I'll tell you what, i tell you what, why don't we just go ahead since there seems to be no more questions. Uh, what, let's start from the, from the end. Uh, go ahead and jump into that. So what did you guys do <clears throat> uh, Adam and uh, to the animal? Oh. Did, did uh, Allison or David? Did oh. you guys well, one thing that we were talking about is um, th there's a, a quote that Martha Graham had said, which just said, movement never lies. And um, and then that, that line really struck me that, you know, that, that if you look at body language, you kind of see everything. <laughs> and that the animal's shivering and that the body language applies to animals as well as to, to humans. Interesting. Yeah, that's that's good. Right. And as the first and as the first human, he's not that elevated. There's no culture. Right? So depicting him as this not even specified animal. That's the image for Adam they're talking about, right? That's why it's brought up here. Right? So um it's not a very elevated image the way other animals are used to represent things of power or prominence or busyness or glory. This is like the barest differentiation between human and animal. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I, it sorry. also says it makes it sound as if it says the affect, at least in my translation, it sounds like the affect stirs first and then the animals covering or I guess hide maybe follows it. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm not sure on that one. I think that's true. I think. Uh, uh, Allison, I just uh, can, uh, can I just ask you a question? Did you just mention Martha Graham just now? Yeah, I did. Yeah. Oh my God, I yeah. just haven't heard anybody mention Martha Graham in <laughs> years. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> this whole book keeps making me think back to these things she said. It's funny, like I read different things and I'm like, oh, that's that one, that's that one, that's that one. They, they I only mentioned, read she, one. Was, she was my, she was my Martha, idol for a while, for many years, your, Martha Graham, yeah. Allison, was, mention, mention your personal connection, Allison. I, I studied with her, actually, yeah. Oh, did you? I yeah, did. I studied at her studio for a little while as well. Oh, really? Of course, mm -hmm. I studied at many studios in New York for many years, so. Yeah. <laughs> funny. Wow. Forward. All right. Um, let's go back to Joe's question about why do you think uh, Dante gets tested on Christian virtues and not cardinal virtues? What are your thoughts on that? Uh, Isabel, did you want to take that? Yes. Um, the, uh, he does not get tested on the cardinal virtues. There was no need for that. They're galore in purgatory. And also, uh, except I don't have where I got it from, they are represented in the first four heavens uh, already. The cardinal, vir the, uh, cardinal virtues, temperance, prudence, justice, and fortitude. They mm. are already uh, 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 sh uh, symbolized and with, with the sinners and, and the planet 
already they are pointed to in that. And, and because you need the seven, um, you need uh, the four plus the three, the, 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 uh, uh, the um, I forgot what, <laughs> theological vir virtues, the seven virtues. By the way, another division has been the uh, trivium and the quadrivium. For, for, I don't know if anybody went into that, but that's quite interesting. Uh, the, the, the trivium would be rhetoric, dialectic, and grammar. That would be towards the end, and the quadrivium would be. But that's another division in which you can also separate the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the heavens, the spheres, the, the, the heavens. Sorry, that was uh, rhetoric, grammar, and what was the third one? Dialectic. Dialectic, uh, forgive me. And, and just to not to be a spoiler, but uh, Dante is the king, the non plus ultra of rhetoric. Keep that in mind when you read the Commedia. And dialect, dialectic might just be closer to, we think of logic, right? Yeah, uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, the dialectic is the ability, as I understand it, the ability to hold a discussion, um, maintain good points, uh, to be able to uphold your, 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 your discourse and, and be able to converse and, and um, discuss. That yeah, it's, also, it's also using Aristotelian logic, it, it's exactly. the idea yeah. of syllogisms, you know, going from... Um, a major premise, a minor premise to to the conclusion, from antecedents to consequence, as they would say. Um, okay. I was going to, yeah, Sorry? I was going to. I, I, not being a person of virtues, I don't really I know quite the difference between the cardinal and the um, and the uh, what's the other word? Religious. Virtues theological, but I have a feeling that the cardinal virtues are more rational, reason-based, and discerning about judgment. And we've gone through that training for two books, and we mentioned them here, but the higher virtues, right. the ones that really matter for love, are these beyond reason virtues, the spiritual ones that take not your calculating, but your... I don't know what it's reasoning beyond reasoning, right? So these are the these are the ones where you have to transcend. You drop your calculator, you know. These are different. So these are the ones where his heart is turned. It has to do with the heart, sort of. Yep. Thank you, David. That's that's great. That's that's a good point. I I think that's that's right. Does anyone else have any other questions or topics they wish to discuss? Um, we, we've gone for two hours. I'm happy to stay for another uh, 15 to 20 minutes unless you guys are tired. Uh, I have a couple of things I wanted to, to discuss, but I don't want to usurp your time. Um, I'm so sorry, but I, I am tired and I wake up too early. And, um, um, I, but I have to leave you, but I will be with you with your, your session. What is your next session? So I'll write next it down. Month. Next month. Next month, mm -hmm. I'll be there. Thank you so much, everybody. And okay. There's another. There's another one on a Wednesday that CJ is going to be leading. Another what? There's another session, a Dante session that CJ will be leading on a Wednesday. Oh, oh, I didn't realize that. Okay. It's a comprehensive Wednesday where he's pulling Dante into the comprehensive. Oh, I see. Thing. Um, also, the next one is at two o'clock. Well, two o'clock Western time. Okay. I, bye, bye, Isabella. Bye, Arrivederci. Thank you so much, everybody. <laughs> uh, we have two people that raised their hands. Um, uh, Elena, you want to go first? And then Maxine after her. Yes. So we just bring with me from our discussion uh, in our room a question about, obviously, what, what came to me is that since uh, the, the two parts, the, the heaven and the how, um, is it uh, they they are a part of the universal structure of the of the uh, of the universe therefore without uh, uh, they, th what what do you think about the necessity of purgatorio as it is in order to for the for the par paradiso to exist because of that's how they are say, 
they, they the, the poem brief, just just brings up this structure of the world and it doesn't perhaps even say that um, you know the purgatory wasn't necessary because we would love to have just the paradiso in our life right but perhaps without the purgatorial part there would be that paradiso wouldn't be able to exist so what okay. do you think about that uh, let me try to paraphrase your question uh and you tell me if i'm doing it correctly what is um what is the necessity of having purgatorio and is it necessary to have purgatory in order to have paradiso is that is that the right yes to 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 translate me into english yes <laughs> okay so who wants to take uh okay so let's let's table that for just a second and then i want to uh maxine what is your question and we'll, we'll try to answer both of them you know okay so we reached heaven and when we got to heaven, everything seems to be going around in a circle. So we have the power of not remembering. I mean, am I on the right track? Because it looks to me like we go around in a circle and it starts, it, it's time to go back to hell. I mean, how is this set up? that once we get to the top, we forget everything and we go back to doing what we did before? That's, that's a good question. I like that. Uh, <laughs> very too. <laughs> okay, so, so let's, let's uh, I'll record that. Uh, and then uh, let's go ahead and uh, see who wants to answer Elena's uh, question about is purgatorio necessary part of the, uh, the structure of Inferno and Paradiso. Do we need Purgatorio? Is Purgatorio a necessary prerequisite for Paradiso to even exist? Who wants to take that up? That's a deep question. Oh, okay, go ahead, Doug. I mean, very briefly, I think the, the Purgatory is this sort of a rhythm of each of these floors they go to, and there's a virtue that if you don't practice, and it always does lead off with something about Mary and then something about somebody else as a positive virtue example. And then the negative examples often come from pagan literature or other things. And, and the rhythm of that expansion into a virtue and the fear of the vice, that is a kind of breathing rhythm in Purgatorio, which I think uh, is really essential to the journey. Uh, and it's entering the world more of hope, or not hope, because they know at some point they'll enter paradise, but it may take thousands of years or may happen relatively quickly, depending on how they pray or who prays after them. And that theme's picked up in paradise that Bernard prays for Dante to marry and not only to be able to see God, but to remember the lessons when he returns to earth. So this, this sort of, and prayer is a really big element in purgatory because it can improve things. And they all say, go back and tell my relatives I'm here. And if they pray for me, I will make progress. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Anybody else want to try that one? That's a, that's a tough nut to crack. Uh, yes. Yeah, it is. Like, um, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Joe. No, I was just going to mention, I, I mean, historically speaking, too, um, it's a way of raising funds. <laughs> I mean, in the sense that, <laughs> you know, you're, you're, you're raising funds for the, you know, uh, souls in purgatory, essentially to, you know, as, uh, for prayers in purgatory. Um, so we'll pray for the souls in purgatory if, if you know, his way, and they were selling indulgences. So that kind of led, that kind of backfired on the Catholic Church a little bit, but but that's one practical aspect of it as well. Uh, okay, yeah. Uh, uh, David, did you wanna add to that? Yeah, I was, uh, <clears throat> Elena's question. Um, I, I think it would be jarring to think that there are only two choices of your fate if you're, you know, someone reading this because you may not, really feel you qualify for the inferno, but you're pretty sure you don't qualify for Paradiso. So, you know, you don't. So you're going to be in the inferno. And that would be a really hopeless way to have to read this, 
So Paradiso is something you should hope for, but being practical, you're going to have to expect that all the mistakes you made in the world that were significant, you know, that were living on after you, that they can be fixed. That's what prayers are going to help fix the mistakes and repair the, the threads where you weren't tied to the divine light, but you were doing something on the earth that was disturbed. And the fact that that can sort of be measured so the, the the horror of how bad you are is only finite and you, there is there's actually hope that you're going to make it out of that to heaven i think it means for the average reader that this isn't just something you can read in a totally detached way because i couldn't see myself in either of the extreme places hmm. okay so like a middle ground between two extremes which yeah actually is in a bad place compared to the more likely choice if you're you know if you're thinking you have to choose between where you belong and how good you've been right, right. Mm -hmm. exactly okay madeline go ahead and uh maxine after her please <clears throat> yes um this is just a, a very ignorant question uh, about the whole system of prayer for uh people who've died I just, I, I don't really understand why it's necessary to have human participation influencing God. I mean, doesn't God already see and know um, what effect that person had in their lifetime and how people remember them? So that, I mean, that's, that's a question or an answer, I'm not sure, <laughs> or both. Uh, it's it's a question. I mean, what I I don't understand the whole. Um, oh, I've yeah, never. Yeah, I, I don't understand the whole system of praying for people who've died. Right, 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 right. But then I, I mean, Madeline, I'll jump in here. Um, yeah, I can. Your memory is an important thing on the earth, and what you've done is what's remembered. And the idea is that speaking good things about what you did brings more of that good into the world and remembering the good things and acting on those ties people in real life to towards more positive things and remembering the bad and all the bad outcomes of what you did if you hoarded money and were a bad politician and leader those things may be irreparable and you're in hell but you know other things you did that had bad results they have to be worked out before you can feel you're deserving even if you're alive to feel that, you know, you know, you've made mistakes and you can do certain things to fix them, but other people also have to be engaged in that. You have to convince the world, you know, it, it, but you've heard people, you have to also help them through it. And having prayer is, is a matter of their attitudes being affected too and affecting each other. So um, I don't think we're that isolated from each other that we, we have to help each other. Well, thank you, David. Uh, so I guess it's like, um, you know, if you're trying to make amends to someone for something that they that they that they've accepted your apology, it's healing for them too. David, yeah, yeah, and, and your family, and you know that everyone feels responsible for what they've done, and that their family feels that you know regret over things that. You know, if you're one of the Medici's, you may feel bad about some of the things Cosmo did. And, you know, the only way to redeem that and to have his name not be a curse is for people to go forward and say, well, you know, what he did gave us some power and we want to do some good with that. So there won't all be bad. I mean, you have to redeem things, right? Uh, Doug, go ahead. I think there's also an element of what's talked about in, uh, you know, Zen Buddhist, the Sangha or Buddhism, the Sangha, the group that reinforces the energy that's at work, that meditating with other people. And in Paradiso, that's a big thing. The light and the way it moves among the different lights, sort of they echo each other and they expand and they build on each other. And so I think prayer is a way of sharing energy. I don't think the prayers that are paid for are what are going to work. It's the prayers of loved ones and family that will move people forward. I don't think the uh, the money prayers are what's going to work. They always say, "Go back and tell my daughter. Go back and tell my wife. Or go back and tell uh, you know a family member or a friend to pray for me." Okay. 
Uh, Maxine, did you want to try to answer that too? No, I'm waiting for you to answer my question. Right. Okay, okay then. Okay. okay. But All right, so before we get to that, um, in Dante, they are pushing love, not remembrance. The remembrance is on the low part of the totem pole. Remember, they don't want you to remember. They want you to block things out um, because that is stressed in this poem. And what they push in um, the last part of it is love. So answer my question about going. <laughs> okay, okay, let's, let's rephrase. So let's uh, repeat yeah. um, Maxine's uh, question, which is uh, we're back to revolving in going in circles in a sense uh, in the final canto of Paradiso, are we essentially, uh, have we come back to where we started with, with basically going in circles in Inferno? Uh, who wants to take that? Wh while you guys are thinking, I will, I will actually try to uh, maybe offer my own explanation then uh, maybe that will <laughs> start a little more discussion. So we, in our group, we were talking about something similar, and Isabel pointed out to me, uh, again, uh, the symmetry that exists between Paradiso and Inferno. And we were talking about, um, in that particular discussion, how the rose petals, which are essentially like an amphitheater, uh, are very much similar to the Bolgia in hell. So you go around, and it's almost like you're going down in the theater, right, towards the stage. But in Inferno, at the very end of the stage is frozen Lucifer. Whereas here, you have the opposite of that, which is Godhead in its glory and its light and love, et cetera. However, you do have that similarity. It's just a contrast. It's a symmetry. So it's actually not totally surprising that we've gone from going around in circles in Inferno to going around in circles in heaven. But there is a radical difference, which is the quality of, that, of, this, of this revolution. So in Inferno, you are being punished and you are stuck and there's no progress. Whereas here, what we end up with is you are in, or, in essentially in God's orbit and you're orbiting where the, the movement that God propels is essentially the same as what you is in line with your own desires and will. That's the difference. Whereas in hell, they're all frustrated because their desires and their wills are not in line and will never be. And therefore they are forever in this sense, in this kind of sphere of frustration. Whereas in Paradiso, it's the picture of perfect um, harmony and accord where you are essentially going in that same lane, like a, uh, for lack of better analogy, like a, you know, uh, in Europe, uh, that Autobahn, where you get on it and you are flying <laughs> without any kind of impediments and that sense of freedom, because you are, you're not going against the traffic, you're with the traffic, and therefore you are on your way <laughs> and enjoying the speed. <laughs> I, I'm, uh, she, no, go ahead. I want to point out to Maxine, I don't think the forgetfulness is um, a hazard or a, um, a crippling. What it is, I think it's a forgetfulness of your physicality. It's a forgetfulness of your being pulled by your desires and sensations. They still remember what happened on earth. They still remember, they, they have a past, you know, and, it's, and, and in the inferno, they lost their, they lose their awareness of time as it passes. It's all very perverse, you know, but I don't think that's what lay the, the, the river that he drank from. It wasn't that, it was, it was making him forget the burdens of being physically alive that distracted him from his view of Beatrice and the, the, you know, there are things you want to forget when you want to do the right thing, right? And this is, this was a purging of that in that really positive sense of forget about that. It's not the important stuff. You don't have, you don't feel that anymore because you've worked your way out of that. So it's a sort of a, 
a rising forgetting that you know that's there and you've forgotten it, you know. Oh, thank you. Uh, uh, well, what can you uh, say when you're <laughs> on the top? You, I mean, you are now on the top. Where do you go next? What are you going next? Okay, that's a separate. The top question. of what? Oh, the top of what? Let's with the first one. <laughs> we are now at the end. We are at the top. We are. Uh, okay. Well, what's next for him if he would go on? Yeah, you mean the top of what? The top of purgatory or the top? No, of... paradiso. Paradiso. I mean, yeah, I don't think it's a top or a bottom. I think it's a spherical thing. It's sort of inside outside. We're kind of outside everything once we go to God. Would he stay there or would he slip and go right back down again? <laughs> well, that's what uh, Bernard prays to the Mary to make him remember and so that he doesn't slip. Bernard actually puts in a prayer to Mary to intercede so that Dante does not fold his cards and get lost in another dark wood. Okay. <laughs> yes, that's good. That's good. Um, I but did the want geography to... is like spiraling down to hell, then crawling out of hell, then spiraling up, or as, as Phil clarified for me, you circle and then you climb up a crack and then you circle and climb up another crack and then you go through a gate and other crack. You're always going through these cracks in the mountain, which I'd never thought in terms of Moses. And then I think it's important to realize what took me a while to realize, which I don't think I really got the first time I read Paradise about 20 years ago, is that it's spherical. It's a, it's re, you have to think in spheres once you get to Paradise. And, and the travel is not walking or climbing, it's quantum leaps. It's like it's instantaneous jumps from one. It's, it's strange the way he almost anticipates atomic structure and the shells of atomic structure because they leap from right. one cell to the next. Yep. In and fact, some people eye, from the time he looks down to looks up, he's in another sphere. It's instantaneous. Uh, some people have suggested actually a hypersphere which is a uh, higher order of dimensions, uh, not three-dimensional spheres that we're familiar with, but uh, like a four-dimensional, five-dimensional, uh, which were not known, of course, at Dante's time, but it was maybe conceptually, people have thought that since we, you know, if there's a three-dimensional world, there may be a, such a thing as a four-dimensional um, or n-dimensional spheres, which are called hyperspheres. Um, uh, Elena, did you have another question? I just, I'd like to add to the Maxine's question. It's um, just combining it from other, with other philosophical points of view is if you don't finish your prop, uh, if you don't finish the journey of uh, ascending to Paradiso and you may run out of time, you have no more quantum quantum leaps attempts and then you go back to to whatever so just there uh, again it's not it's not in Dante's uh, poem but that it's something that I just it came to me and I'd like to share so perhaps again the question because if it's a sphere right there is nowhere to go you have to complete the the the, the journey one at, at some point and if you ran out of time perhaps you 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 are you go back to the lowest level. Who knows? <laughs> Again, I don't have all the answers, but that's one of the possibilities. Well, and, I, uh, I, I want to propose that Doug is actually correct in say, in pointing out that you know that prayer to Mary is very fitting towards the end of the journey, and it maybe may function more than just a prayer then and there in terms of Dante's perception of the Godhead. Maybe it has a larger significance as to what you are suggesting about regress, right? So far it's been progress for us. That's why it's comedia, right? Comedia is going from something bad to something good. Now, what you guys are talking about would be another reversal, right? Going from bad to good and then back to bad. That would be a tragedy. <laughs> so, so we're not in tragedy mode, we're in the comedy mode, which is happy ending. Uh, which we should all be <laughs> accustomed to being uh, Americans, most of us here. Uh, so, <laughs> so happy ending for sure. Uh, however, it, there, is, there is that question, what happens afterwards? And of course, Dante 
has hinted along the way that he's he's not done yet. He needs to go back to earth. He needs to record it faithfully what he saw. And he also needs to live out what he learned from all of this. So it's a very fitting um, uh, maybe way to finish this is to think, okay, well, what are the possibilities and will he be able to complete this task and what's involved in, in, in this being a comedy really, right? How do we finish well? Because while he finishes with the beatific vision, in reality, he is not finished. He needs to go back and he needs to prove it to himself, right? That he has, but thinking back on his life, I think we probably can say that he did well, wouldn't you say? He did well, he recorded it and we have enjoyed it. And you know, it's been a tremendous inspiration for, for people through you know, many, many centuries and we're still discussing it. Uh, yeah. Go ahead, David. Do, do we say it in this group or our side group? Because we were in there for a while. We said a lot of, a lot of great things were there. That um, so at the end, yeah, I think this is some Beatrice asked uh, our Beatrice asked about, you know, so the end. What's his charge? What's his? What's he have to do now? He because he's in this state, this elevated state, and brought back. So he's charged to make all the prayers that he promised to make and tell all the stories he promised to tell. So he's charged to write the divine comedy. So he comes back and he does, he does what he's supposed to do. Um, that's what he had to do after doing this. So yeah, there's, there's something, although I think his life was not very happy. It was strife and misery, you know, and he never got the reward that the, he maybe could have deserved or would have envisioned coming back to Florence never happened, did it? No. Never really happened. And I really like Doug's observation how uh, after going through, you know, the ascent, the descent down, the ascent up, and now we're in spheres and we're doing quantum jumps. And then we see that the larger and larger spheres, when you get to the ultimate, the really smaller and smaller spheres with the inside being where God's on the total inside, but not, you know, so the largest is the smallest, smallest is large. And he identifies that as just the world of appearance and that the physical spatiality of the physical world is the opposite to spatiality of the spiritual world. So trying to understand this, his vision with all the symmetries and how appearance is fooling and, you know, you have to know where the light is. It's just, it's, uh, it just blows my circuits. But I love the idea that the, the largest level is the quantum level is the smallest level and they're unified here. That's just really cool. The other ahead. thing I wanted to say is when he sees God, all this is building to seeing God and having the strength. He stops dead. He doesn't describe God. He just stopped. He actually says, I can't remember what happened. And he prays to God to give him some flicker of what he saw. And then he describes some flavor of what he saw. I mean, it's a really strange thing. But then he also, near the end, somewhere, I can't remember the canto, he talks about the pilgrimage, and somebody gets to a temple in one translation, where they get to the destination, and they essentially spend the journey back, wondering how they're going to describe that to people at home. So he's gone to this journey, he's seen the light, and its most intense level, and then as he wanders back to the world and through the world, he keeps trying to retrieve memories and figure, because I think that's a key thing that the pilgrim walks to a destination and then he walks back and what stories, like in a fairy tale, when he comes home, what stories are gonna tell about his journey? Mm -hmm. And so that's a big thing. How do I put this experience into words? For sure. And so it's the writer's dilemma that he's at the end of the, experience left with and he spends what 20 years writing this what did you say phil from when he started and when he finished <clears throat> yeah i was definitely de not, not i don't know about 20 17 18 years maybe like that, yeah 16 uh, 17 years of that, yeah for sure and uh, beethoven i think even said he got the structure of a symphony almost instantly but then it took him a long time to write it out you know mm -hmm. i did was there another question maxine No, okay, because you have your hand raised on me. No, you, you probably didn't put it down. Uh, Don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All but right. I'll, I'll try and think of another yeah, one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's why that's why Shrikan typically has you guys type in the exclamation point because it's clearer 
uh, once you call on somebody. Um, okay, let me do one more thing before we go. I wanna share one other file with you. This is something I put together for today's meeting just as a uh, reminder for me of different topics. And I just wanna share with you in case you find it useful. There's also some information here that I um, basically shared about Mary. Uh, again, just um, to take a look and see if there's anything on there that spurs your interest or uh, we can use it for, for discussion or any other last observations or summations for today. Well, maybe while you're looking at it, just um, one other observation that we were talking about in our breakout room was the this idea of remembrance and the Sibelian oracles, which were written on leaves to be scattered by the wind. And of course, um, uh, Dante is comparing that to his inability to retain all of the you know, the wonders of this vision that he saw. But at the same time, you have this picture, right? This simile of, of the, the leaves. Uh, but on the other side, there's also a picture of the Godhead as a collection of, or concentration of all knowledge and wisdom, which is typically scattered as pages in a book across the world, which again, is just another beautiful uh, simile, but also contrast with this um, earlier, earlier comparison. So we have so many threads all coming to this one beautiful picture of, of both the diffusion of, of knowledge that happens in our experience and human experience, because we, you know, we have imperfect memory and imperfect recall, and yet also this divine concentration of all the, what he calls accidents, and uh, substances and everything else. And this is, this is towards the end also in Canto 33 uh, that he talks about this. Uh, in fact, let me give you the verse so you can see what I'm talking about. Right, so this, these are verses 85 through um, 90 in Canto 33. So this is where he talks about the profound volume that's all bound up within the Godhead. And then right before that, we talk about the snow that melts and the, the, leave, the or, uh, oracular leaves or the... Uh, prophecies, and this is uh, verses 64 through 66. So both of those beautiful uh, similes, the imagery there is really quite something, especially when you put the two together. But both talking about um, recording of artistic impression, I guess, or knowledge. The last lines you referred to are what? Uh, the last lines are uh, about 45 to uh, 64 to 66. And this is um, the sort of the evanescent nature of, of, of these impressions. You know, it melts like snow and it also is, sp is spread out by the wind. Uh, so the idea was that the uh, oracles, the Sibylline oracles, were written on leaves. And the reason you would do that is so that they're scattered by the wind, they're not kept permanent because I guess they're for a particular circumstance only. They're not supposed to be kept. They're not meant to be kept. Uh, the, the interesting part is when Aeneas gets an, uh, besieges Sybil in uh, Aeneid six for her uh, oracular insight, he asks her not to write it on leaves. He wants her to just to recite it. Uh, and then 
So this is similar to how Dante is receiving all of this, right? Nothing is written down, it's all recited. Then he has to keep it. Okay, um, if there are no more questions, um, Doug, did you wanna say any last words before we part? Well, just uh, very brief. Can, 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 before, before Doug speaks, could I just add something since I looked at the picture mm -hmm. and I'll just bring up something okay. radical, the concept yeah. very radical. What <laughs> if, if you complete the journey correctly, perfectly, and you are at the highest level of paradise, what if you totally leave this particular, particular world? And you go outside that, say if it's a game, right? Or amphitheater and whatever is the theater, the mystic rose. What if you complete the journey, you'll go somewhere else and you are not a part of that system anymore. So something to leave everyone with for tonight. <laughs> Thank you. Right. It's like, it reminds me of the questions people ask, well, what happened before the Big Bang? So just tell me, you know, what, what happened before the Big Bang? <laughs> Same kind of question. All right, uh, Doug, uh, any, any thoughts, parting thoughts? Yeah, the, the, the thing I wanted to talk about that we did talk quite a bit about in our group was the idea that this is a text that's about texts and scriptures. And it, it, it almost assumes, I didn't say this in the group, but it, it connects to it as, he doesn't really name names much in Paradiso. You kind of have to know from the actions of the character who these people are. So you have to be familiar with a certain number of texts to be able to know how he's riffing on previous texts, maybe co-opting them for his own, but they're pagan texts, they're Christian texts. They're all, kind. it's like a real text on, so it's a real poet's obsession with reinterpreting what he's inherited from the past in written words and how he's going to rewrite a new story. He's going to restring everything with a new storyline. Uh, so the, the other thing I wanted to point to is I put a link there to Gerard Manley Hopkins, The Golden Echo and The Leaden Echo, which somebody reminded me it's a favorite poem of Richard Burton's actually, the actor, the British actor. And it's kind of, it was an Episcopal priest who I think became Catholic and then he wrote this poetry that's like jazz, but it's in the middle of the 19th century. He's writing this stuff. And so the Golden Echo is like an incredible piece of poetry that really captures in English, I think, the ecstasy that Dante has probably captured in Italian. And so there's, uh, uh, there's a link also to the poem there. And the, it sort of relates to the last question that Elena brought up. And it says, and the poem ends with, uh, here, I'll just read the last few lines. When the thing we freely forfeit is kept with fonder a care, fonder a care kept, and we could have kept it, kept far with a fonder a care, and we, we should have lost it, finer, fonder, a care kept, where kept, do but tell us where kept, where, yonder, what, as high as that, we follow, now we follow. Yonder, yes, yonder, yonder, yonder. And so in a way, what we go after we've reached the end of this is we go yonder, we go further, we keep going. Upwards and onwards. Yeah, oh, what? <laughs> Upwards and onwards. Yeah, no, and I think, and he's writing this stuff in the middle of the 19th century and it's the most jazz-like music in the English language until you get to the, maybe the beat poets or, uh, mm. Uh, Kenneth Fearing does it a little bit, but it's like interesting. Also, Doug, you put the link to um, uh, George Santayana's book, right? Yeah, on philosophical poets, Lucretius, Dante, and Goethe. Which yeah, if you guys also... want to take a look at at the chat, there's a link to that there. And this is something that maybe you might want to take a look at for the next for the next meetup uh, next month because we're going to be talking about you know, the entire gamut of, of Dante's works, starting from La Vita Nova to the Commedia, we're going to look back at everything we've read and try to pr provide some sort of synthesis, synthesis uh, of, of his entire thought and, and worldview. So this might be a helpful book. I haven't read it myself, but Doug recommends it, so I trust his uh, 
Well, I, I stumbled on it, uh, and uh, Will Durant mentions it in one of his books, uh, and I thought it might be illuminating because the summary of it talks about Lucretius, Dante, and uh, Goethe as being steps in Western philosophy. And uh, uh, let me try to put this in. Uh, it's based on a course taught at Harvard, and... Uh, I'm sorry, I can't find it right now. He was influenced by, uh, uh, let, me, let me try to do this. Oh, I can't, it's not cooperating. I'm trying to cut and paste something. But if you look for this book on Goodreads, there's a summary of the book and there's a summary of the book that talks about the stages of philosophy and what each poet represented from the scientific to the supernatural, I think Dante, and then to the romantic with Goethe. And so that's a very interesting construct that uh, Dante refers to Lucretius and Goethe certainly probably read Dante. So it, uh, I haven't read it, but it looked really like intriguing. Okay, well, anyway, take, take, yeah, take a look. Beatrice, did you want to ask something? Yeah, I just had a quick question. I don't know if you mentioned it somewhere these past couple of weeks, but do you think that um, this work was influenced by Odysseus's uh, travel to the underworld and and the sirens and the lotus eater eaters. Yes, most most certainly. Uh, in fact, in our breakout rooms, we were talking about Ulysses as uh, one of the few characters who is mentioned in all three parts of the Commedia. Uh, and of course, in this last part, uh, we he's mentioned right after the mention of Adam and the connection between the two is that as follows, that both of them transgressed a limit. Adam transgressed a boundary by eating the fruit and Ulysses transgressed, <clears throat> transgressed a boundary by going beyond what is humanly allowable. And as he, was, he tried to get to purgatory bypassing the, the kind of the allowed route. He tried to sail there versus getting there sort of the, the right way. And uh, both are pictures of, of this um, sort of human folly, a pride, a hubris, if you wish. Um, yeah, but there are lots of influences, of course. The largest one, of course, is the Aeneid. Um, the Aeneid. The Aeneid? Is, yeah, the Aeneid. Of course, Virgil being the, uh, the guide through Inferno and Purgatory uh, is, is, <laughs> is, a, is a hint. Um, uh, and if, now that we've switched to Beatrice and finally St. Bernard, we've had four guides, but Virgil is by far the most important and the one that figures most prominently. But the, the thing is, Homer is the great poet too, but he doesn't get mentioned at all, does he, even once? Or is he- He does get mentioned, he's in limbo. Circles? Is he flying in one of the circles maybe? He's in limbo. He is resting on his laurels in limbo. However, keep in <laughs> mind that, uh, that uh, Dante did wrong, have... wrong language, wrong language. Is that the part? It's oh, not Latin. No, no, it's not that. It's much more prosaic. He did not have access to Homer's Iliad or Odyssey. In you know, he just had access to uh, quotations or excerpts by the Roman authors, the Latin <sighs> authors that he had access to. So he did not read the Iliad. He did not read wow. the Odyssey. He just knew about them because they were quoted everywhere throughout the classical canon. But the Aeneid he had access to, so he was a student of the Aeneid, and of course, chapter six of the Aeneid is when where uh, Aeneas goes into the underworld, and a lot of a lot of the detail that we see in Commedia is based on based on that. Interesting. Yep. All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. It was a great time, as always. Hope you enjoyed it, and we will see everyone uh, one month from. Yeah, thanks, yeah, thank you, thanks, thank you, Doug and Phil for everything. Sure, no, thank you. I mean, all really, all I mean, it's it's yeah, it's a lot of work, and I we we all appreciate it. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I learn a lot from all of you. The angles you come at it, it's really wonderful. You know, all of your participation. Thank what you. A trip. What thank a trip. You. It's a trip. It was a journey. <laughs> <laughs> So the next meeting is like a closing night party, 